We've been talking about the book of Job. We've actually worked our way over to ch through chapter 14, just hitting the high points, looking at the argumentation, so-called, that Job's friends are using to try to tell him that, Job, you've got to be the worst person on the face of the earth or these kind of things. Horrendous evils and calamities would not have happened in your life. Just acknowledge that and everything's going to be fine. And Job maintains, I haven't been living in a different way than when all of these things were going well and I was endeavoring to live a life for God and were trying to be pleasing to God. I haven't changed. I don't understand this. For this time together, I want to talk about the statement that Eliphaz makes the second time he talks. We've gone through one cycle of, of speeches. Each of these three friends have taken their stab at trying to tell Job how bad he is and how right they are. Eliphaz starts again in chapter 15, but the problem is he's looking for wisdom in all the wrong places. Here's what he says. Should a wise man answer with windy knowledge and fill his belly with the east wind? Should he argue an unprofitable talk or in words which, with which he can do no good? What he's saying is, Job, you're full of hot air. You're making no sense at all because you're disagreeing with us. You're raising questions that really you shouldn't ask. Nobody should ask those kind of questions. Just accept the things we've always believed. In fact, in, in verse number three, should he argue in a profitable talk or in words with which he can do no good? It's the assumption that we've always been correct. Don't try to question it. And then beginning in verse four, you are doing away with the fear of God and hindering meditation before God. Job, you're guilty of that. Now, Eliphaz does not tell us how Job is doing away with the fear of God. Eliphaz does not tell us how Job is hindering meditation before God. Again, assumption upon assumption. Paraded as wisdom. In verse number six, this friend of Job says, Your own mouth condemns you, not I. Your own lips testify against you. He neither gives example nor evidence for that. Again, assumption. Why is that the case? Well, Job is actually questioning what I believe, and we can't have that. He's raising some questions we should have thought about asking ourselves a long time ago, but we have just been operating on assumption as fact all through our life. In verse number 8, he asks some questions, verse 8 and following. Have you listened to the count in the counsel of God? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that is not clear to us? Now go back and think about this. The statement in verse 8, Have you listened in the counsel of God? You can almost retort the question back for Eliphaz. Have you? The assumption is, well, we have, but you're not. Or do you limit wisdom to yourself? Isn't that kind of what Eliphaz and his friends are doing? Hasn't Eliphaz built that and, and Zophar all three told Job, you're wrong. You, have got, you must be mistaken in the way that you think you're innocent. You've got to be the worst and the most evil person on the face of the earth for all the things you've suffered. Do you limit wisdom to yourself? They are. What do you know that we do not know? Well, maybe Joe's point is, I, I know we're basing our understanding on assumption. We always have. Maybe that's not a correct way to think. What do you understand that's not clear to us? Maybe the fact that I'm actually asking questions for once. And here's the assumption, another assumption involved in what Eliphaz has to say. Both the gray-haired and the aged are among us, older than your father. Are the comforts of God too small for you or the word that deals gently with you? Why does your heart cry out, cry, carry you away, and why do your eyes flash? Why are you upset about any of this? You deserve this kind of, of suffering. But the statement, the assumption, both the gray-haired and the aged are among us older than your father. The wisdom of age is something that's assumed. Just because somebody has been around for a long time does not mean that that person is wise, but that's the assumption. It continues. Down in verse 14 and following, what is man that he can be pure? And it's the same kind of statement that you find in the very first speech of Eliphaz. 
in chapter 4 of Job in verse 17 and following, Can mortal man be right before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? And here it is, what is man that he can be pure? Same kind of question. And he doesn't seem to understand the implication of his own statement. If nobody can stand pure or right or just in the sight of God, then evil fast, you cannot stand right or just before God either. And if I'm suffering because of that, then you should be suffering as well. They, there's a disconnect in the way the friends are actually thinking about this whole problem. Beginning verse 17, I will show you, Eliphaz says, hear me, and what I have seen I will declare. What wise men have told without hiding it from their fathers, to whom alone the land was given, and no stranger passed among them. Are you basing that on investigation? No. Eliphaz, in the conclusion he is reaching, is not upon investigation of the problem of good and evil. I'm taking my information from other people. And they've got to be correct. They're older than I am. So this is the conclusion that I reach. And then he starts talking about the problems. The wicked man writhes in pain all his days, verse 20. In prosperity, the destroyer will come upon him, verse 21. Distress and anguish terrify him, verse 24. Verse 26, running stubbornly against him, he stretches his hand against God, verse 25 and 26. Now those are true statements, but the assumption is that it's only the evil that ever have problems in life. Everything that Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar have been saying is based on an assumption. It is not something that has been proven, and they are arguing, at, arguing it as fact. Looking for wisdom in all the wrong places not willing to even anticipate that I may have missed something or I may have jumped to conclusions or that I may be operating on some kind of misconception. Now when Job answers in chapter 16 and 17, this is what he says. In chapter 16, the statement is made in verse number 4. I could also speak as you do if I were in your place. I could join words together against you and shake my head at you. I could be negative or, verse number 5, I could strengthen you with my mouth, and the solace of my lips would assuage your pain. I could be uplifting and positive. You guys have just been negative. Later on, the statement is made in verse number 10, that the scorn of those around Job, men have gaped at me with their mouth. They've struck me insolently on the cheek. They massed themselves together against me. Job maintains his innocence, however. Verse 16 and 17, my face is red with weeping, my eyelids deep in darkness, although there is no violence in my hands, and my prayer is pure. In verse 20, my friends scorn me. My eyes pour out tears to God. Verse number 2, chapter 17, surely there are mockers about me, and my eye dwells on their provocation. Verse number 10, but you, come on again all of you, I shall not find a wise man among you. You're looking for wisdom in all the wrong places. You're assuming that you're wise based upon all these preconceptions, these conclusions, not based upon any kind of evidence at all other than what you've always heard. When people do not do their own investigation, when their knowledge is limited to what other people have said, other people have told them, and they don't scrutinize the statements that they hear. There is something that's problematic in culture. And we see that all around us today. Just like in Job's day with his three friends, there are huge numbers of humanity that are looking for wisdom today in all the wrong places. Never assuming that they can be incorrect because so-and-so said this, and so, so smarter than I am, so so-and-so must be right. How smart is that? Actually, it's not. The book of Job, the problem of human suffering, and the assumptions that are made by many in his day, including Job for a better part of his life, until these things happen, he starts questioning things. It's a very relevant book. Read through the book of Job, with a point of view that you're reading about individuals talking about things today. You'll be amazed at what you see.
disheartened, but amazed. May we grow beyond the limitation of looking for wisdom in all the wrong places. Please stay safe. We'll talk again soon.